So warm welcome to everyone to this week's An Audience with the President. It's my great pleasure to welcome you. And if you're watching this as a recording, thanks for stopping by and finding out what we got up to in this next hour. So my first duty as your chair is to hand over to the president of the Spiritualist National Union, who will also introduce his guest. So please welcome Minister David Bruton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you with us once again for our regular uh, hour spot on Monday night at seven o'clock. And wherever you are, I hope that, uh, I hope it's actually a little bit warmer than it is, it is where I am, but uh, I, I trust we're gonna have a brilliant evening. Back in 1932, a gentleman that I'm sure many of you are well aware of called Morris Barbonell, guided by the actions of the spirit world, established a new publication in spiritualist journals. Uh, if you look back at the history of the movement, um, spiritualist newspapers and magazines had existed for a long time. But the newspaper that started in 1932 was something distinctly different, something that was aimed to be more popularist than what had gone before. And of course, uh, that newspaper uh, grew and grew and grew and became very well known throughout the whole movement and was sold literally around the world. The gentleman who is my guest tonight has had, I suppose really what you could call a lifelong association in one way or another with psychic news. He has been the editor for the three times on three different occasions throughout his career. And having been sent his CV, he has, without doubt, had a fascinating career and worked for some amazing people. And uh, I hope we'll be able to touch on that and discover that. He actually took the baton of the editorship of Psychic News uh, when back in 1981, uh, Maurice Barbonell took his transition to the spirit world or his promotion to the spirit world. Uh, Barbonell um, worked, I understand, uh, literally to the last minute, and he was actually sub-editing the paper on the very day that he passed to spirit. So uh, he, he, his dedication to the paper was legendary. And my guest this evening, as I've said, has had three uh, times as the editor of Psychic News uh, from 1981 to 1992. He then returned back in 2004 and that's the time when personally I got to know him because obviously at the time the paper belonged to the Spiritualist National Union and uh, I have very many pleasant memories of um, our walks in the kitchen garden at the Arthur Finley College uh, discussing how we were going to uh, take Psychic Press together. He returned to the editorship again in 2018 uh, for his latest stint. And if you haven't already guessed, uh, my guest this evening is Tony Ortson. Tony, we very much welcome you and thank you for being here tonight. It means a great deal to have you as with part of audience with the president. Welcome. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Good, excellent, that's brilliant. Now I'm just going to quickly uh, move my script and I'm going to uh, look at uh, my questions for you. As always, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start the discussion with Tony and ask him some questions and then we'll open up um, the evening so you can have the opportunity to also ask him questions. And boy, this guy has got such knowledge and has had so much experience within the movement. So I know we're in for a really fantastic evening. No pressure, Tony, you'll be with <laughs> So a first question I've got to ask, because I don't know whether I've ever told you this, I think I might have done. Um, one of my great regrets uh, in spiritualism personally is I never had the opportunity to meet Maurice Barbonell. I, I became a spiritualist in 1977. As we've said, he died in 1981. So I, if I pulled my finger out, I perhaps could have met the, the man personally. 
So, Tony, I'd like to ask you, um, given the fact that uh, Morris was the editor when you first joined Psychic News, what was it like to work for? Well, I first joined in um, 1972, and there was a 50-year age gap between us. And so often, if I said something um, that wasn't appropriate or didn't sound that bright, he would just put it down to the inexperience of youth. <laughs> and physically, he was fairly small, about five foot six or about five foot seven. He had very bad eyesight, and so he wore thick glasses. Always wore extremely smart clothes. Um, to use a somewhat old fashioned word, he was very, he was somewhat dapper. Um, in those days, we all had to wear a suit to work. We're talking about the 70s and the early 80s. We all had to wear a tie. Um, his office, when we were in Hoban, got the sun all afternoon. And on a particularly hot summer's day, he didn't say anything but he was very disapproving if we took off our ties. <laughs> um, personally, he, he was always very kind to me. Oh, the cat's just come in. That's why the kitchen door is just opened. It's, oh, not, a, it's not a spirit visitor. <laughs> <laughs> I said to David, the moment I start doing something important, the cat always comes in. He wants to go out in the moment. He was, he was a very kind man. Um, Maurice Barbanel never drank. Um, and so when it was my 21st birthday, he took me to a pub. He had, I remember he ordered um, two cheese sandwiches without pickle. And he bought me two gin, very large gin and tonics. Didn't get much work done in the afternoon. But his greatest gift to me was saying, would I like to go and hear Silverberg speak at the Hannah Swaff for Home Circle? Well, years previously, when I began to investigate spiritualism, I never, ever, ever thought I would be invited to hear Silver Birch. Um, in a way, Maurice Barbanel was um, old fashioned, but in a rather charming way. We started work at half past nine. We then worked until half past five. And every night we had to knock on his office door to ask if we could go home. He, he was a kind person. Um, I always call him Mr. Barbonell. Uh, all his old friends and a few staff members of long standing called him Barbie. And because I was never ever granted the privilege of calling him Barbie, even all these years later, I still refer to him as Mr. Barbonell. Um, when I look back, I sometimes think that at, at the time, I didn't realize how much I learned from him and how lucky I was actually to work with him on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a bit like if you're having a relationship or you live with somebody and we're all rather guilty of taking somebody for granted. And it's only that after they've passed on or they've gone elsewhere that you value what you learned from that person. And so he, he, he was a good boss. Um, he was fairly strict. Um, he would often rewrite my introductions. Uh, <laughs> what I particularly liked was that um, in those days, Psychic News was a weekly newspaper and it was printed in Essex, in Colchester. So we had to get the half past eight train from Liverpool Street. And on the way back, we generally got the four o'clock train back or the half past four train back. He would sometimes look out the window and reminisce about times past, about his childhood, or about Hannah Swaffer. And because we were not in an office environment, he let his guard down slightly. I'll I just give you one or two brief examples. We were coming through the East End once, and of course, Maurice Barbonell uh, lived in, I think it was Bethnal Green. Of, uh, he was born in, I think, 1902. And I'm, whilst the area is very expensive now, I suspect it was very down at heel then. And I remember he once said to me that in their home, the beds were full of bed bugs. And on a, nice, on a nightly basis, they would wet bars of soap and go, got you, got you, got you. 
to get rid of the bed bugs. And it's little stories like that he would tell me. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Over the years, Tony, you must have met some giants within the movement. Who, who, you know, who comes to mind? Who, who, who really um, impressed you? Or perhaps, conversely, who didn't impress you? <laughs> I, I, because I joined Psychic News in 1972, which is a long time ago, um, it's, it's been a real privilege to have met so many famous mediums. Doris Collins, Doris Stokes, David Young, Robin Stevens, Ina Twig. I could give a long, long Gordon Higginson. I could give you a long, long list. Two people impressed me particularly. The first was Doris Stokes. And I chaired meetings for her um, all over London. And I chaired for her several times at the London Palladium. And my job was very simple. I just had to walk onto the stage and stand there all on my own and speak about Doris for four or five minutes. And I would just look up and there was row after row after row of faces looking down at you. And now and again, it didn't show, but I could feel a slight tremor in my, le in my leg because I was nervous. And I used to think, Tony, you're doing such a small amount this evening. You're only chairing and making sure everything runs to order and nothing terrible happens. Doris would come sweeping on, tell a few jokes to, to adjust herself and ease herself into the seat and what have you, and then start giving survival evidence. I cannot say that Doris Stokes was the best medium in the world. Uh, some nights were better than others, but what was so endearing about her was that what you saw was what you got. She truly was a lovable, mumsy person. Yep. Uh, even when she was on television shows, she never considered herself a celebrity. For example, she was on BBC Radio 4's Desert Island Discs, which is going to this day. And that's been going for decades. What Doris Stokes did do was, and not only in this country, her, her combined books, she wrote six or seven books, uh, sold something like six or seven million copies. What Doris did do was she made spiritualism mediumship accessible and easily so to millions and millions of people all over the world. The other medium for whom I had enormous respect was Glyn Edwards. And I remember about 25 years ago, I organized a meeting at the Mermaid Theatre across the Thames in, in the city. It was a fabulous day, had a lot of mediums there. And Glyn gave a demonstration of psychometry. And so I said, could various people in the audience hold up their hand if they had an item like a watch or a bracelet or an earring or a wallet or something for Glyn to psychometrize? I chose the people. I selected the items. Glynn gave such a brilliant demonstration of psychometry. Now, as we know, psychometry, strictly speaking, is reading the object, reading the history of an object or an item. But as with most mediums, Glynn used the item to give absolutely superb survival evidence. Um, I think the two other mediums that greatly impressed me were David Young, who was Irish, and Robin Stevens, because they consistently gave excellent survival evidence. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Let's just um, bring things up to, to date a little bit with my next question. Uh, I think I'm right in saying, Tony, that um, Psychic News has been published online uh, for most of this year because of the pandemic. Um, what are the plans to return to physical printing? Well, the moment the majority of churches reopen, we will start doing a physical magazine as well. Um, the problem is and was that as the majority of churches are closed, and don't forget at one point a lot of news agents were closed, it just wasn't financially feasible to produce a printed magazine. Um, now it's a very generational thing, and I don't want to sound ageist, but people of my age 
I put it this way. Youngsters are very used to reading newspapers and publications online. If I send somebody a text on my mobile phone, it's very plodding. I go, du, 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 du. kids go, du, 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 and it's all done. Um, so there was no alternative but to do an online magazine. Um, I dislike um, reading publications online you have all that fiddling about going up to, up and down and side to side i prefer to sit down with a cup of coffee or what have you and actually feel the paper feel the publication yes. on the other hand it does mean if somebody wants to meet, read the magazine online especially if they're abroad they haven't got to pay a huge amount in postage um, and if I just expand on that slightly, the pandemic has brought the most terrible things to this world, but I'm a great believer in trying to find a positive aspect, no matter how bleak and awful the situation. One of the very positive aspects is that a lot of SNU churches and a lot of spiritualists generally have got used to going online. And now a lot of churches have gone online with services, etc. So it has suddenly made our movement accessible to a lot of people who either can't get to church easily because they're in firm, who either can't get to church because it's too far away, or because they're an inquirer that knows nothing about spiritualism and wouldn't want to necessarily enter a spiritualist church. So I think the pandemic has brought us that small good thing. I agree completely. Now, this may seem a very strange question, Tony, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Would you call yourself a spiritualist? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I first began investigating spiritualism. I was 69 yesterday, by the way, so I'm now in my 70th year. <laughs> I, I feel terribly old sometimes. <laughs> I, I began investigating spiritualism when I was a teenager. And those in many, many years ago, and there were magazines like Tip Bits and Rebelli and Weekend and the News of the World that often featured spiritualism. And the moment I saw it on the front cover, I would buy the publication. If we fast forward a few years, um, I think in 1969, I began my first job as a, a trainee reporter on a weekly newspaper in Chesham in Buckinghamshire. And after about a year or so, I was virtually allowed to choose my own features. And so one day I said to the editor, well, I'll tell you what, um, can I do a feature on the local independent spiritualist church in Chesham? And he said, yes. So I popped along one evening, did a nice two page feature about the spiritualist church. Um, the medium was a, a little lady called Betty Nugent from Harrow. The important point about this story is it was at that church, A, I first saw a demonstration of mediumship. Perhaps more importantly, I saw psychic news for the very, very first time. I'd never heard of it before. And so the next day I went to the news agent and started ordering psychic news on a weekly basis. And if I just leap forward to another six months, um, as an indentured reporter, I attended two block release courses at Highbury Technical College in Portsmouth. It's a sign of age that's now been renamed something else much classier. And for uh, the course, we had to write a dissertation of I think 3000 words, can't quite remember now, but I chose spiritualism. So I did a huge amount of research and then discovered the SNU, got information from the SNU, got information from the Greater World Association, got details about the Spiritualist Association of Great Britain. And so, and I must have, I must have been about 18 or 19 then. And so doing that investigation um, gave me a, a really good overview into spiritualism. So yes, I've been a spiritualist for many, many years. So then that leads me into my next question to you. Spiritualism is undoubtedly changing. Do you think for better or worse? Um, in a way, for the better, because the public have a greater understanding of it. 
Um, I'm not commenting on the quality of mediumship, but until about three or four years ago, on British television and abroad, there were an enormous number of programmes featuring mediumship. Um, I watched one or two and wasn't very impressed, but it did make spiritualism and sometimes very questionable mediumship. And I, has, I must add, I'm not including SNU mediums. Some of the mediumship was not very good, but these programmes made people think about spiritualism. If Maurice Barbonell were physically present today, I think he would be a bit disappointed in that in the last 50 years, um, the standard of mediumship, particularly about 20 years ago or so, did decline to a degree. However, since that stage, I think gradually the standard has improved a great deal. Brilliant. Um, my next question, um, and I don't particularly want to get too political, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask you to anyway. Um, you'll remember, Tony, I know you weren't actually involved at the time, but the SNU was very heavily criticised for putting the paper into liquidation. And I just wondered what your thoughts were, were about that. Looking at the time, I criticised the SNU for closing the paper down. But that was, an, an, a, really, one should never write when you're in the midst of a, of a dramatic and an upsetting situation. And because at that point I'd worked for Psychic News from 1972 to 1992, I think, and then 2004 until 2008. Oh, and I'd also edited two words for about 14 or 15 years. At the time, I was very upset that the paper was closed down. Um, they always say that the, with the hindsight is the gift of kings, and that's quite true. With hindsight, the SNU had no alternative but to close the newspaper down. It was losing a lot of money. It, again, it was not financially feasible. Uh, I suspect the spirit world knew exactly what would happen because uh, a charity came to the paper's rescue. It was relaunched as a magazine. And whilst finances are still never particularly rosy, the paper was relaunched. I think if I had been running Psychic News at the time, I would probably have reached the same decision to close it because you cannot continue running a loss-making publication ad infinitum. Absolutely. And, and it's great to see, because obviously this, I dealt with this when I first became president of the union. That was one of my, the first uh, items in my inbox. And it was a challenging time. And also because of my association with Psychic News, it was also a very emotional time as well. Yeah. I tell yeah. you, Tony, in researching Maurice Barbonell's life, um, and obviously Arthur Finlay was involved at the birth of um, Psychic News, I know that they set very firm principles from the very beginning that the company had to be run on business lines. And um, that's the only thing that I think saw me through that we, we, had, we had no choice to do what we did, you know? Can I just add something there, David? Particularly when I edited, two, particularly when I edited um, Two Worlds, churches would phone me up and say, we just haven't got any money. You know, people look, people put so little in the collection box. And I would say to various treasurers, look, I don't want to sound harsh. Whilst you are running a spiritualist and therefore a spiritual organisation, any spiritualist business or spiritualist church has to be run according to strict business principles. Because if there is more money going out your front door, than there is coming in the back front door, you're going to fold. And time after time after time, I would say to treasurers, please, just once a month, say to your congregations, to keep our front door open, costs us 75 pounds or 80 pounds a week, or whatever it is, that includes gas, electricity, refurbishment, mediums, fees, decorating, a long, long, long list of things. Absolutely. So, the, so the, the, the principle, 
uh, applies to publications, publications and our places of worship. Well, Tony, as we're approaching 7.30, I've got one last question for you. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've had, had the privilege of looking at your yeah. CV and you've had a, such an interesting variety of jobs over the years. Which was your favourite? Oh, psychic news without doubt. Um, I'll tell you what else I, I really enjoyed. I know that the government has now closed down all the homeopathic hospitals in the country. Under the National Health Act of 1946 or whenever it was, it was guaranteed that homeopathy would be covered by the National Health Service. A lot of people say it's a lot of absolute rubbish. It does not work in the homeopathic tablet there is none of the original substance. That is quite correct, because a homeopathic remedy is diluted and diluted and diluted. For a year or so, um, I edited a magazine called Health and Homeopathy. And I assure you, I assure everybody, that whilst there may not be a scientific basis to homeopathy, it does work. And it is not purely psychological because it works on babies and it works on animals. I would also say, people think they're terribly bindly dull, but I would also say the same applies to the batch flower remedies. Again, believe me, they do work. And this sounds, I don't know, not very intelligent. Some things are beyond science, but I was fascinated by, by the, the whole subject of the, and in fact, sort of the book, which also explained homeopathy on a more occasion. And incidentally, uh, uh, they had a naturopathic doctor or they would go to the Nature Cure Clinic. Now that said, whilst I do take natural remedies, I have the greatest respect for the medical profession. Uh, and I always take the view, if you're ill, you take the best from the allopathic world, you take the best from a complementary field, and also never forget the spiritual healing, whilst it is not a cure-all, because no system of medicine or treatment can be a cure-all, spiritual healing, whether it's absent or contact, can provide the most tremendous betterment, if not a cure. Well, Tony, we could carry on talking, I know, for a long time, but um, we've hit 7.30. So I'm going to hand over to Alv and open the floor for our uh, audience to ask you their own questions. Can, can I say one thing? Can I say one thing? I hope I'm not boring because my cat's gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, you may have put the cat to sleep, Tony, but we're all riveted. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Tony, and, and Tony's cat as well. <laughs> so obviously this is an audience with the president and we we find this part of the session which is over to you the audience really important because it gives you an opportunity to ask the questions or just to make a point that you'd like to make in response to anything that Tony said so in order to do that I can ask you to raise your hand which you will find at the bottom of your participants list if you've not got that open click participants to open it, or you can type the question into the uh, chat box and I'll pick that up and ask Tony on your behalf. So thinking caps on everyone and it is time to ask your questions. And so first off, I'm going to invite Alan into the room. Alan, could you put your microphone on and could you talk to Tony? Good evening, Tony. Nice to see you again. Hello. <laughs> I, um, as well as a publishing or being editor for Two Worlds and the Psychic News, um, which took up a lot of your time, in your spare time, you compiled lots of Silver Birch books, anthologies. Um, have you exhausted all that he, uh, all the teachings that he gave us, or is there still more available? Um. Well, I definitely have been exhausted as such. Um, I don't own the copyright to the Silver Birch teachings. They're, they are now owned, and rightly so, by Spiritualist Charity. 
Um, I'm not being grand, but I, I just don't have the time to, you know, to compile it, to compile any further books. Um, I think another one or two might have come up. What's really exciting, Alan, is I think, I mean, I said before, I don't, I don't care for reading publications on computer very much. But what is great is that now I think some, I think all the Silver Birch books are available on Kindle. So you can, in fact, read them on your tablet or computer. Um, I suspect that the majority of the teachings have been used in that some of the books I compiled were one book out of two much earlier books, which were published perhaps in the, in the late 30s or the early 40s. But there are something like 9, 10, 11, 12 Silver Birch books available. So an enormous amount of his wisdom can readily be purchased and enjoyed. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, I have to tell you, I was saying that for my 21st birthday, Morris Barbner invited me to meet Silver Birch, as it were. So I went to the, the Barbernells flat. Oh, by the way, if anybody wants to see where the Barbernells lived, if you type in Adelaide Court, London NW8, you will see the block of flats where they live. And I checked this evening, and you'll see a front door. Looking at the front door, if you go to your right, you will see two windows on the first floor. That was the Barbanel's living room. And between the two windows hung that beautiful portrait of Silver Birch by Marcel Ponsin. The next, uh, the next single window was a small bedroom that was occupied by June, their living home help. The next window is the Barbanel's bedroom. And um, I have to say that the first time I went to the Hannah Swapper Home Circle, I felt spiritually naked because I thought of all the, the less charitable things I'd ever said or thought in my life. But as ever, Silver Birch was so kind and so loving. Right. Good. And can I just come in there, Al, for a second and comment um, <laughs> that the portrait that Tony has just mentioned and also um, one of Hannon Swaffer, who was Barbanel's great friend and business uh, associate, um, JV Trust have approached us over the last few months. Those pictures obviously now belong to JV Trust because uh, they were part of the company that they bought out of liquidation. Uh, but they really feel they have had both pictures, portraits, um, renewed or replenished, if you like, or whatever the technical term is. You can say I've got no little of art. Um, and they are actually going to um, allow them to be displayed at Stansted Hall um, just as soon as we can start uh, moving about the country again. Uh, the, the ownership will retain, be retained by the JV Trust, but they want people to be able to see the pictures. And they are both beautiful pictures in their own right. So just thought... Can I, that, can I, sorry, can I just add one thing there, David? After Maurice Barbanel passed on, um, I had a letter from the solicitors and Maurice Barbanel had left the picture of Silver Birch to um, his wife, Vera, who lived in Canada. And I wrote to her saying, would it be at all possible for the gift, uh, would she be willing to gift the picture of Silver Birch to Psychic Press, which she did. Otherwise it would have left Britain and gone to Canada and possibly been left forever, have been lost forever. Brilliant. Oh well, well it will be, hopefully from next year, it will be hanging in Stansted Hall. Good, good. Fantastic. So we have uh, another hand up from Julie. So Julie, I'm going to ask you to switch your microphone on and to talk to Tony. Hello, Tony. Hello. Have, have you ever had a psychic experience or seen uh, or anything since you're involved in that sort of interest in that sort of work? Well, yes and no. Um, I told this story a few years ago when I had the great honour of the day with opening the Barbanel Centre. Um, the night Maurice Barbanel passed on, I was at home. It was a Friday night. And I remembered absolutely vividly because he phoned me on the Friday morning 
And Maurice Barbonell was never, ever, ever ill in all the years I worked for him. And he said, Tony, I'm not feeling very well. I'm going to stay at home today. Um, oh, the cat's scratching the setting next door. Um, he said, he said, he said, um, I'm going to stay at home today. Go downstairs and use my office, which I did. And I phoned him about five o'clock. He said everything was going very well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And not to be concerned. We went to press on a oh. Tuesday, so we didn't have much time left. Well, I went home and I was then living in Islington in North London. And MH Tester phoned me about half past seven or eight and said, Barbie's gone. And I said, gone? Gone where? He said, Barbie's gone. I said, where? Gone to hospital. He said, no, Barbie's gone. He's passed on. Well, it's too long a story to go into. But in fact, I had given six months notice mm. because I planned to emigrate to Australia. We won't go into that. However, I put the phone down. And I was just standing in the hallway feeling somewhat dazed. And all of a sudden, a, a bright blue light that sparkled a bit like a sparker on bonfires night yeah. appeared out of nowhere. It came towards me, touched my forehead there, went yeah. back. It didn't go ping, but it sort of pinged and then disappeared. Now that was unusual and it was not my imagination. Um, and, and at one time, um, in, in a non-professional way, I used to love practicing psychometry. And again, like Glyn Edwards, we just use the item as a link to the spirit world. And yeah. um, so um, whilst I'm clairvoyant, and I haven't practiced it for many, many years, um, I only had a clairvoyant gift when I was practicing psychometry. Um, and I saw, saw all sorts of Unusual things. Um, I remember once I, I gave um, an absent uh, an absent sitting to somebody in Wales. I was then living in Holland at the time, actually, and I was holding whatever this lady had sent me. And all of a sudden, I swear this is true, I saw this eel thrashing about the table at which I was sitting. And I, I said to the tape recorder, I really can't explain this. But I've seen this large eel thrashing about the table. And I think it means a place called Ely, but it's not the one in East Anglia or wherever. Well, again, to cut a long story short, it turned out the person communicating had lived in Ely, which I'm, I've probably got this wrong now, which was, I think, a part of Cardiff. And then another time I was giving somebody a sitting, again, non-professionally, and I said, I keep on seeing this goose and lots of white feathers, and I don't understand why. And I said, well, I've the person kept goose, the name goose, the name goose figures in their surname, or they kept geese or something like that. And all of a sudden I said, oh, I've got it. The person communicates, communicating with a conscientious objector in the First World War. And people disapprove of somebody being an objector, it often gives them a white feather in the street. So whilst, so whilst I, I'm by no means a professional leader, I have had fascinating glimpses. Oh, good. Thank you. It's interesting. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for that question, Julie. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, before we go over to Elaine, who I know has a question and a hand up, um, I've got a quick question here from the chat box and it comes from Kevin who's been doing some research on Maurice Barbonell and uh, wants to pick your brains Tony and ask yeah. is it is it right that uh, Maurice had a son from his first marriage so obviously mm -hmm. someone doing some quite in-depth uh, research there. This is a fascinating story and I can bring it bang up to date. Um, Sylvia and Maurice Barbonell were married in 1932 he did have a first wife. I don't know when they were married. And the son was called Derek. And the marriage, I don't know why, was very short-lived. And then this must have been, I guess, in the, in the late 1960s, that Roy Stemmen, who was then assistant editor, opened the post at Psychic News. I, I, even if it was not private and confidential, 
whoever opened the post was, was always told, open the letter, Boris Barbalo would say, I've got nothing to hide. And a letter turned up saying, dear Mr. Barbanel, I do believe I could be your son, Derek. And so Roy went in and said, oh, there's a letter here from some bloke that says you're, uh, he's your son, Derek. And Maurice Barbanel said, you're right, you're correct. I did have a son called Derek. Now, if we could fast forward to the time when I was at Psychic News, now and again, great pride, Maurice Barbanel would say to me, oh, Sylvia and I are off to East Anglia to stay with my son, Derek, and his wife. Um, now, earlier this year, somebody was doing some research about the Barbanels and other matters. And I remember that Derek and his wife ran an adult educational institute in East Anglia somewhere. And we managed to, tra to, to track it down. And what's interesting is I did a bit more research and I discovered that Derek Barbanel only passed, I think, in January or February of this year, aged something, I think, I'm sure he was 90. I did a bit of research on uh, Derek Barbanel. Um, from memory, he went, I think it's to a Quaker boarding school and then went to what was then called Rhodesia. I forgot what it's, it's been renamed now. Uh, and then came back to the UK. But what was interesting was, again, it was on a train coming back from the printer on a Tuesday. Maurice Barbanel was telling me about some of the survival evidence he received over the years. And I cannot remember the name of the medium, but he was on the phone to a medium and the medium said, this is strange. I can see it's a lily, but it's black. And Maurice Barbanel said to me, at that point, I knew my first wife had passed on. So I assume her name was L Lily Black, but he never gave me any further details about how long they were married, what caused the divorce and why he didn't see his son for something like 40 or 50 years. That's fantastic. And Kevin, thanks you for that. And he, he, He's obviously been doing some research and confirms that it, it was actually Lily Black was the name. So that's interesting. Oh, it was. Uh, can, can I very quickly tell, because I trust this will interest other people. Um, I've only told this story once before in public. Maurice Barbanel and Sylvia went to America. They went by boat at the time of the abdication crisis. And they stayed with um, Marjorie Crandon, a famous American medium. And at one point, Marjorie Cranton put a, a china potty on her head and minced up and down the room, pretending to be um, Wallace Simpson. And again, this is a, a, a story Maurice Barbanel told me on the train on a Tuesday. Anyway, Marjorie Cranton passed on. And some years later, Maurice Barbanel was on the phone. It may have been to the Welsh medium Evan Powell, but I can't remember. And the communicator came through and her message was this. My august representation got everyone roaring. Your clue, a po. Now, the count on my fingers. The first eight words, my, sorry, the letter of the first word spells out Marjorie C. Marjorie C. My august representation got everyone roaring, your clue, that's Marjorie C, a poem. And that was the potty she had on her head. Fantastic. Oh, to be a fly on the luggage rack of those train journeys from <laughs> Colchester to London all those years ago. <laughs> I'm going to invite Elaine now to come into the room to switch her oh. microphone on and to ask your question. Go ahead, Elaine. Hello, nice to meet you. Hello, nice to see you too. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you tonight. Um, no, no, uh, there, there, there was not, I'm a very ordinary guy, believe me. There's nothing <laughs> special about me. And I'm, I'm not being you know, self modest, you know. Ask away, um, please. I, I'm really, really fascinated uh, by the fact that you sat in circle and saw Morris go into trance. And yeah. I just wondered two things. One, 
how long was he in trance for when Silver Birch came through? And secondly, did you feel the atmosphere change when he came through? I'll tell you what would happen. Um, the other circle members were Francis and Vernon Moore. Francis took everything down in shorthand and Vernon Moore, I think was an ex Methodist minister. There was Renee Jessup who lived in Victoria though she always said it was Westminster, she thought it sounded better, and Charles Burkett, and they'd been members of the circle for many, many years. The circle always met, I'm sure it was on a Friday, and on the occasions I went, <coughs> we would drive back to Morris Barbonell's flat, and then uh, guests would, and there, there would always be one or two guests at the most. In the Barbonell's flat was a, a, a two-seater, very nice, comfortable yellow settee. And Maurice Barbonell would sit on the right-hand side of the settee and Sylvia on the left. Maurice Barbonell would take off his glasses like that. He would look down like that. And then we would, all the guests would just carry on chatting. And all of a sudden, he would look up slightly and Silver Birch would suddenly speak and give the most beautiful greeting what is so fascinating about the Silver Birch teachings are that Maurice Barbonell never knew in advance, ever, what the questions were going to be. And yet Silver Birch always gave an instant answer. Um, what I would say is that Silver Birch brought a feeling of great peace into the room. I went to the Barbonell's flat quite a few times over the years. And although it was in a very nice, a very nice part of St. John's Wood, people sometimes say, oh, he must have made pots of money out of spiritualism, wrong. They rented the flat. And in those days, the local council had a rent tribunal and they would set the rent, not the landlord. And in their flat, there was the most beautifully peaceful atmosphere. And obviously, um, I wasn't uh, around in the 1930s, but it was a bit like the 1930s, in that if you were offered a cup of tea, June, the housekeeper, would bring in a trolley, and on the trolley was um, a tea service that had a silver birch design. And this is, this is, this is the rather quaint bit I, I liked you would be offered India or China tea. And the Barbonells had um, a very quiet lifestyle. The picture of Silver Birch, as I explained, was between two windows. And beneath that was uh, a very modest sized television. They watched television modestly. They went to the opera now and again. Um, they wouldn't wa watch absolute drivel on television like some of us do to relax. They were very careful about what they watched. They would listen to classical music and they would listen to the radio a lot. So it's, that's a rather, a rather long answer in your, to your question. You know, there was the most beautiful feeling of peace and tranquility in the flat, even when Silver Birch wasn't there. It was always terribly hot. I'm thin and I feel the cold appallingly. Sylvia Barbnell was thinner than I am. And so even in the summer, the central heating was on and the place was like an absolute greenhouse, which I think Maurice Barbnell found very difficult to live with sometimes. Oh, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thanks for a great question, Elaine. We're into incredibly our last 10 minutes, so we'll try and squish these last two questions in that I have from the chat box. So the first one comes from Catherine. And Tony, she asks, is there a particular issue of psychic news that stands out for you? So, for example, uh, a particular item that was in there or perhaps a, the biggest sale, something like that, that stands out? I can tell you the issue that stands in my mind. It was the issue we had to produce uh, the week Mar Maurice Barbonell passed. Most of it had been done. And as I explained, we went to press on a Tuesday and he passed on a Friday night. So I got a cab to the office, I think. I had to send, in those days, you sent telegrams to people like um, Lady Lindsay, 
better known as Michaela Dennis. A few years before he died, um, Maurice Barbonell opened the office safe and he took out the obituary that, of his own life, his own obituary, and he showed it to me and let me read it. And I remember thinking to myself, the next time I see this obituary is probably the day he passes on. And so it was. And so we had to redo the entire issue of psychic news. And um, in those days, we did an animal welfare issue once a week. And quite once, once we did an animal welfare issue. And psychic news, the title, was normally in black. But for the animal welfare issue, we did it in blue. And so I said to the printer, to honour Maurice Barbonell, let's do this in blue. And that issue will forever be etched on my heart. And whilst we um, all believe in survival, obviously, it still came as a tremendous shock that Maurice Barbonell literally dropped, quote, dead in his flat. Um, as it happens, the naturopathic doctor, I understand, was there, but could do nothing. Morris Barbonell never, ever, ever, in my presence, lost his temper. But I'm told the doctor said to him, look, Mr. Barbonell, I'm really sorry. You're going to have to go to hospital. Morris Barbonell got very heated about this. And at that point, literally fell to the floor with a heart attack. But now this year's psychic news will always remain very, very dear to me. And in fact, we because he'd made such a tremendous impact on spiritualism and done so much to promote spiritualism and mediumship and our philosophy over so many years, we did in fact do two issues devoted to his life. And I'll never forget those two issues. Well, a very moving response there to a great question from Catherine and you know, those little insights into a, a great pioneer's life that I think our spiritualist has affected us all. We've got just a few minutes left, Tony, but we have one final question and we stay with Maurice Barbonell as well. And George asks you, do you know uh, of anything that he ever told you about his tour of South Africa? I didn't know he'd even been to South Africa, right? I, I've been found wanting there. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I know he went, I know he went to, I know he went to America uh, on at least one occasion and more than one occasion. Uh, I wasn't ever aware that he'd been to Africa. I know Sir Arthur Conan Doyle went to Africa. Oh, hang on a second. Um, Michaela Dennis, Lady Lindsay, lived in Nairobi. There's a possibility that they went to stay with Michaela. I'm sure we all remember those old black and white um, programs on television many, many years ago called On Safari with Armand and Michaela Dennis. In those days, believe it or not, there was only one channel and the screen was about six inches wide or something. It may be that the Barbanos went to stay with Michaela um, but I wasn't aware that he did. He certainly never toured Africa uh, in the time that I knew him. And as I explained before, I first met Maurice Barbonell in 1972. Thanks, Tony. But obviously, you know, he did travel further afield and I'm sure took spiritualism wherever he went. Yeah. We're almost out of time now. We've made it to the end. Your bandwidth has seen us through, Tony. It was a bit shaky at one point, but we didn't lose you, so that's fantastic. So I'm going to hand back to David now uh, for his closing remarks. Well, in closing this week, can I just thank Tony uh, tremendously for what's been a fascinating evening. I have to admit, Barb and Ali is one of my heroes. And I think that goes for many of us in spiritualism. He made such a contribution to the movement. And tonight we've seen, perhaps for many of us, a slightly different side of Barbanel that we may not have been aware of. And that's wonderful. And Tony, we thank you so much for what you've done and for joining us tonight with audience with the president.
looking forward, ladies and gentlemen, next week we have another good friend, uh, Professor Chris Rowe from Northampton University, who's bringing along with him a couple of his PhD students. And we are going to be revisiting for audience with the president, the scientific aspect of spiritualism. I know it's gonna be a, an excellent evening. And Chris also is a very, very knowledgeable person, even though unlike Tony, I know he won't call himself a spiritualist, but I'm sure we're in for a good evening. On the 21st, we have our Christmas special. Um, we'll be hopefully able to tell you a little bit more about what we've got planned for then. And on the 28th, we have an equally fascinating evening where we are going to visit reincarnation, a subject that I know for many spiritualists is perhaps controversial. And I'm sure we're going to have an excellent discussion talking about reincarnation from a gentleman who will be known to many, many of you uh, but I'm sure you perhaps won't appreciate his interest in this particular subject. But I'll, I'll tell you more about that in, the fu in future weeks. Can I thank Tony again? Can I thank Alva's always for controlling the technology and keeping everything together? And thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next week uh, when we visit spiritualism and science. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, before he goes, let's all give uh, another uh, thanks to Tony. Thank can you, I add one thing very, very quick? Can I break you the can. rules and add one thing very, very quickly, Elf? You can. Okay. Um, one of Maurice Barbell's foibles was that, that in the morning and in the afternoon, he smoked two enormous Cuban cigars. And on a sunny day, the smoke which was in layers, looked a bit like ectoplasm in, the, in his front office. The point of this story is, to my utter shame, I also smoke. I've smoked for 50 years. So I'm now gonna have a cigarette, a glass of white wine, and some delicious homemade vegetable soup, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I'm sure you deserve it, Tony, after such a, a, a wonderful hour. And I know everybody here would like to join me in thanking you. Some, Great feedback in the chat box. Everybody's really appreciated it. Before you all dis disappear off, let me just remind you that we have a website that you can visit at snu.org.uk. If you want to find out more about Psychic News as well, it's very easy. Just simply type Psychic News into Google and you will get there. They also have a Facebook page as well, which I believe is Psychic News Mag. And we have social media as well. So please join us on our Facebook page, which is at the Spiritualist National Union. And we have Instagram and Twitter, which is at Spiritualist SNU. This recording is going to be available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, which is SNU Film. So you'll be able to watch it again. I know a lot of people have been really interested today and it's part of their research too. So thank you all for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week, seven o'clock UK time, Monday evening. Thank you so much for joining us and helping to make these sessions what they are. Without you, we wouldn't have an audience and we wouldn't be here. So it's great to see you all and we look forward to seeing you again. God bless and take care.